On this episode, I answer a shitload of questions. You ask questions and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary V Show. What's up everybody, this is Gary Vay Nurchuk and this is episode 71 of the Ask Gary V Show. We decided since 71 is such a special number and you know, such a significant number that we're gonna have a very special show. It's gonna be called the Rapid Fire Ask Gary V Show. So India, are you ready? This is gonna be pretty intense. D-Rock, you ready? Yep. Let's get in to the show. Tim asked, if you're not from an English-speaking country, should you produce content in English anyways? Or should you produce content in your mother language? Tim, that's a great question uh, with a very simple answer, uh, which is great because I'm answering a boatload of questions today. The answer is you should be speaking in the language of the people you're trying to reach. So if you're trying to reach the consumers in your native tongue, speak in your native tongue, unless English is also the second language and is covering, let's say, 80, 90% of the speakers because then you get the serendipity if it goes outside the boundaries. But it always is reverse engineering the language of your client. If you're trying to reach English speaking consumers, then you've got to speak in English. And again, if English is enough of a second language with a big enough broad stroke according to the overall market, uh, that would be the reason and the rationale around English. Otherwise, it's a native tongue game. Tom Rowley asked, Trader Joe's has a cult-like following with no social media presences. What are your thoughts? Tom, I think Trader Joe's is leaving action on the table. You know, I don't know what else to say. Clearly their business is great and I keep saying it, marketing, great marketing doesn't solve a business's problem but it can uh, accelerate a business's uh, enormous awesomeness. I don't know, that didn't sound right but the bottom line is very simply, Trader Joe's, you may be thinking that you're doing it cool or that brands shouldn't engage if they're awesome and you're a great brand but I fundamentally believe they're leaving a lot of action on the table. I love when people are like, yo Gary, I don't need social media or good marketing. My business is up 23%. I'm like, what's wrong with 60%? Like why can't your business be up 90%, Joe? Luke asks, my little sister has Instagram and Snapchat but has no interest in Facebook. What do you think the future holds for Facebook? Luke, I think Facebook has an issue about the growing population. I don't see your little sister and her her little friends jumping from Snapchat and Insta into Facebook as they get older. No, Insta and Snapchat will become more like Facebook, but will Facebook be in a place where it'll be able to keep its 35 to 70 year olds on its platform and not have them go down to Insta and Snapchat? Listen, Zucks is an assassin. There's a reason he bought Instagram, there's a reason he tried to pay three billion, let me, let's just remind the market, Stunwin. Steve's not here often these days, let's just show him. He's like all super VIP and never around anymore. Uh, you know, he tried to buy Snapchat for three billion. So I think what the future holds for Facebook is if they keep crushing it and doing the things they're doing, which I think they're doing well, and they hold on to their 30, 32, 35 and above crowd, it'll be an enormous business. But over time that will corrode over 15, 20, 30 years. But don't forget, Insta is the new Facebook right now. And so they've got a long lineage. They'll have to make sure that they get the next one after Snapchat. And uh, that's probably their biggest vulnerabilities for a decade out game. But don't forget, they bought Oculus. And so there's a, they're doing a lot of stuff. Look at them like a Google. You know, if Facebook is, is the infrastructure for over the top television or for free internet in America or has the number one phone in seven years, that wouldn't surprise me because that's where I think Zucks' leadership is taking them. Melissa asks, hey Gary, morale in public education is low. How can I as a teacher help to create a thank you economy culture despite government mandates, ineffective curriculum, low funding, and most of all, high stress and pressure on teachers? Melissa, you can't. The, the machine is too big, it's too broken, and what you can do as an individual, I think, is do what I do with the Ask Gary V Show, which is, you know, I think I'm doing education here. You can put out great content to the universe using the platforms that can reach people, and so trying to change an entire machine is extremely difficult. I, with all my charisma and energy and clout, can't move big, te- you know, 
corporate 500 organizations, you want to move the entire U.S. you know uh, academic infrastructure. It's it's not going to happen. Uh, like I'm, I'm I'm sorry that I'm being realistic here. It's not going to happen. And so what you can do though is there's something an individual can always do. They can play in the places that are the white space. The white space right now is for you to put out curriculum on your own to the world in a format like this or whatever, you wanna make slide shares, great. You wanna do Khan Academy stuff, great. You wanna do slide share, great. Uh, you need to work around the system, not within it. Paul asks, so Sprint is taking over the Radio Shack stores, but what is the relevance of Sprint? Is Sprint the new Radio Shack? Paul, that's a great question. I don't know what Sprint's got in mind for Radio Shack. I think physical retail stores need to be innovative and, and have experiences wrapped around them. Uh, you're right. I think there's a very interesting point here that if Sprint just puts up Sprint stores and executes in a Radio Shack way, they become the new Radio Shack. If they don't, and they take a page out of, let's say, Barnes & Nobles that realize they couldn't keep Pete with Amazon if it was just books and made it more of a coffee shop, place you visited, a community hub, and they, they trickled out some sales from that, uh, it all depends on the execution you are what you are, right? People are always like, hey, our brand represents this, so this is what we have to do. It's not true. What you do then becomes your brand, and so the execution of Sprint over the next 24 months will dictate if they're the new Radio Shack or they're the new Sprint Retail Store 3.0. Charles asks, how do you hustle faster? Charles, stop focusing on dumb shit and just keep moving and don't be scared of breaking anything and don't think about perfection and there is no perfect way to cross your T's and dot your I's and don't be crippled and don't be romantic and just move and have no seconds to breathe and just schedule on schedule on schedule, five minute meetings, 10 minute meetings, three minute meetings, eight minute meetings and just move. Rui asks, last year you nailed it when you recommended us to use Medium. What are your recommendations for 2015? I got nothing yet. <laughs> All right. Um, from Lee. Actually, I do have something. Oh, okay. Sorry, India. That's fine. Uh, scared the crap out of you. <laughs> and I'm feeling D-Rock's going to use this footage. Uh, LinkedIn is catching my attention. I'm very shocked over what I'm seeing over the last 10 days of just natively posting content in my LinkedIn feed. Now, I have a huge audience there, and so I don't know how that works out for other people, but LinkedIn's freaking me out a little bit. Not, I'm not talking about Pulse or like Influencer. I'm just talking about my feed, my account. Gary, how would you market a business in an industry that has a bad reputation and people only use it in emergencies? Let's say, for example, the towing industry. Thanks, Gary. Matt, this is a great question, and I've talked about this before. If you're in the towing industry, what I would actually be in is I would become a media company in the travel and car industry. I would create a site that, you know, especially if you're regional, I'm gonna assume that you're doing this towing in a regional area. Let's call it Kansas City, I'm just gonna call that. I would literally call it like kansascityhighway.com where you're reviewing the restaurants, you're giving people shortcuts, you become a community you know, hub of content and information and then sprinkled throughout every third or four posts, you talk about your service, maybe you do a real hardcore right hook where if they click or use the QR code, they put you, your name and your company's name into their phone and then you can control that and put emergency, roadside assistance. Um, I like that, that was a really good idea. That's what you should do, you should become the content player around the culture of driving, highway culture, uh, travel and the general area. Damon asks, Girl Scout cookies are going on sale tomorrow. If you were a Girl Scout, how would you maximize your sales? Damon, one of the moves I would use is try to go viral and go very practical. Clouds and dirt. So I would do hardcore one-on-one -on -one activation. Literally, I would have a five-minute meeting with my parents and ask them who their 11 best friends are and then call them and ask them to buy the damn cookies. I would also then go outside and knock on every single door of every person and I would ask them multiple times. I would twice knock on doors and ring doorbells in the course of a week to show them that I'm gonna relentlessly bother them until they buy a box of cookies. So hardcore, aggressive, in the dirt stuff. Then I would try to do one kind of viral move so I would take a picture of me holding a sign saying, if, I buy, if you guys help me sell a thousand boxes of cookies, I'll do X, right? And so that kind of stuff tends to work. I would do that on Instagram, see if I could get a couple of celebrities I'd hit up on Twitter to show them awareness around this, uh, and then try to create some sort of big event that allows me to really blow it out of the park, going real up there, while that's trying to get viral, knocking on doors. Daniel asks, how do you decide what to trust when it comes to news media bias versus fact reporting? 
Dan, this is a tough question, brother. I mean, I, you know, I don't think I have the answer, right? Like, everybody's got their agenda. Humans are flawed by nature, so everybody's gonna put their spin on it. I, I, you know, what, what, I, what I'm really upset about is watching people only gravitate to the people that are like-minded. I take enormous pride in the fact that I'll watch MSNBC, CNBC, Fox. I, I remember for a year there I was streaming Al Jazeera. Not, not because uh, that I believe in any one people's hyperbole, it's just fun to contextualize. Maybe I'm affected by the fact that I grew up in a communist country and my mom wrote a book report that Fidel Castro was the bravest man in the world, right? And because that was the spin that she got of what he was doing in Cuba against the US. And, and so, you know, if you're self-aware enough to know that people are driving their agenda and that's just the way it is, then what you do is you start hedging everything, right? And it creates some level of balance. So I think it's about being open-minded and trying to challenge yourself to see it from multiple perspectives. But you know, at some level I think we trust the people that most talk about the things we talk about. And I think that at some level can be slightly dangerous. Um, especially now in a social media, digital content, media at scale world. There's so many more voices that can be completely for us. So I'd challenge you, Vayner Nation, to make sure once a day, once a week, at least once a month, you're reading heavily with an open mind the counterpoint to the things that you believe. Home Instead Senior Care asks, Hey Gary, how can a small, local, non-medical, in-home senior care agency incorporate the thank you economy into our business with our clients and their families? I think it's a piece of cake actually. I think you map the data of the families of the clients and you follow them on social, follow them on Facebook and Twitter, see what they care about and if somebody talks about being a huge Padres fan, maybe you uh, ask their loved one to take a picture with a, a Padres hat and then you put it in a box, the picture, physical, yeah, that still happens, with the Padres hat and you send it and say how much fun you're having spending the time with their loved one. I'm sure anybody who's got a loved one in a certain situation getting a letter from that place with this Padres hat because you're a Padres fan and it's saying how much you enjoy having their grandfather or great grandmother in the, the facility would extremely warm their heart and create a real depth moment and you're doing it both physically because then every time they wear that hat or see that hat they think of that moment so it's got more longevity and so the thank you economy is quite easy, my friends. The thank you economy is not about the tactics that I just laid out. The thank you economy is about the religion of actually doing it. Florian asks, how do you see the world in 2018 once the Apple Watch has probably become a vital part in everybody's lives? Florian, it's a great question. I think the Apple Watch has a significant chance of winning. I am 100% gonna get it the day it comes out to just try it. I think smart technology is coming not only to our wrist, but I think it's coming to our collar. I actually think in 2018, 2020, 2022, we'll start seeing the smart shirt at scale where we could be recording. I mean, I'm looking forward to call Steve. Hey Stunwin, why is that article not up? You know, like I'm looking forward to that moment. Uh, and so, you know, how has it changed? I, you know, Anybody who thinks that the smartphone, which is absolutely the most important product in the world, um, anybody who thinks that that's where it ends is clearly not paying attention to how the world works. And so the smartphone will be trumped. Maybe there'll always be a device. Maybe we start putting it inside of ourselves. But I do think smart technology coming to other things in our world, our sneakers, our hats, and definitely our collars. I'm really fascinated. I invested in a company called Cord. Link it. Uh, especially because they're based around voice. And I think voice over typing. I mean, look, everything ebbs and flows, right? Like, like there was handwritten, and then we went hardcore phone. And now we're back to handwritten, but it's thumbwritten. And I think we'll go back to voice. I think it's gonna look like this. Andy asks, I base my Instagram on pics through my GoPro. Any tips on differentiating my content from other GoPro accounts? Andy, this will have to be a part two because I can't give you tips without knowing what your objectives and agenda are, right? And so, I need a little more color. Get back on the show. Jared asks, Gary, why are you scared of cows? Jared, I'm actually not scared of cows. As a matter of fact, I grew up in high school years in Hunterdon County, New Jersey, and we had two cows. Big shout out, Mashka. Um, and uh, I'm really not scared of cows. I was just trying to make the show entertaining. Ryan asks, some companies' timelines are nothing but apologies, such as Comcast. Should they take a break from Twitter and fix their product? Yes. <laughs> And even if your product is completely broken, you shouldn't be in full apology mode at all times. John asks, Blackberry used to be socially hip. Could a new social media approach make a difference or is it too late? It's too late for Blackberry. I'm shocked that they're still in business. Erie asks, hey Gary, my family has always believed so much in me. 
Back in the days, were you more afraid of letting yourself down or your family? You know, I've always been really worried about letting myself down more so than my parents. Kind of feel as though that would be a trickle down effect. If I worried about myself, then my parents would be proud. So, you know, I took a lot of pressure in my mom's belief in me. Um, I took enormous pressure on my dad's belief in me in the way that he kind of like set me up for success and gave me all that autonomy at 22 years old to run a company. Um, but it's always and forever going to be about me for me. You know, it's, it's a very selfish thing. I, you know, to me, it's, um, I, need to, I need to make myself proud and that's kind of how I navigate as a human being and definitely as a businessman and look, I'm not perfect and, and nobody is and nothing. The people that know me the best, they know the only time I'm pissed and I'm feisty is when I'm upset with myself. Kyle asks, you get very personal when building your brand with the public. How personal is too personal? Where do you draw the line? Kyle, I think for everybody it's different, right? I draw a line heavily around the kids, right? I, I don't do a lot of stuff with Xander and Misha, um, but you know, but I'm also thrilled to put out a picture of me being on the toilet, right? Like so, like everybody's got different lines. Some people are very conservative. Some people are extremely aggressive. Like some people take photos nude. Some don't even want to show their belly button. Everybody's got their own objectives, uh, their own agenda, their own north star of what's too much. Uh, for me, I just always go on gut feel. What might be too much last week might not be too much tomorrow. You know, I don't really, I don't really second guess my feelings. I, I've done pretty well with them, and so for me, it's what I'm feeling of the moment. I like getting personal. I think it, it allows people to get closer to you. I mean, I love doing this show for that reason, and so that's where I'm at. Autumn asks, I am wondering what everyone thinks of direct message on Instagram. Is it an untapped resource? Autumn, the problem with direct message on on Instagram, right? Is that what we're asking? Is so far what I've seen is. Um, well, actually, you know, it's interesting. Instagram direct message is interesting because most people are not following too many people that they don't want to be following on Instagram. It's very different than Twitter and other places. I mean, really, if you look at the farm, I'd love to look at the big data of Instagram because I have a feeling that most of the direct message stuff is a hell of a lot more scandalous and a hell of a lot more <laughs> inappropriate than I think people realize. I, you know, from anecdotally, what I'm hearing is happening with Instagram direct messaging is a hell of a lot of flirting and a hell of a lot of, I'm trying to look for the right words here. Um, so, you know, because you're only following people you want to follow, I think, I think from a marketing standpoint, it's hard to get into that because I look at it like texting. It's a place where people have no interest in having people market to them and I would stay very away from Instagram direct messaging as a marketing tactic because I think it's an inappropriate place to go. AJ asks, how can I engage with an audience whose interests are private to them? AJ, great name first of all. Uh, Facebook, Facebook dark posts. There's a way to use the interest graph to get to these people who don't want to talk about whatever misgivings or things they're embarrassed of or not interested in. Um, you can go and look at, you know, you can get into the MasterCard data and see what they're buying. Uh, you know, you could, there's obviously a lot of brands in this space. Um, actually, ha hair loss, is that what we're talking about? Can you pull up, can somebody pull up Rogaine's um, Facebook page right now? Just for kicks and giggles. The real time action. Um, just gonna wait, I'm gonna wait. AJ? Uh, pretty small audience. Of course, nobody wants to talk about, who wants to be like, oh cool, I'm losing my hair, I can't wait to be a fan of Rogaine. But, how big is it? Um, there's no brand page, there's like a default drug page that's 870 likes. There's no brand page for Rogaine? I'm gonna do some more looking. You at. sure? Nonetheless, the, as he's going through that, the 870 people that were okay with going on the unofficial page, there probably is a page, um, because I think Steve will eventually find it, or there's alternative brands playing in the space. The truth is, there's a couple ways to go about it. Um, I would target uh, men in certain age groups. Uh, there's also female hair loss. The, the, Facebook has enough data for you to get there, whether you're going after doctors, fan pages that play in the space, brands. Again, it's absolutely correct that most people aren't gonna talk about it on Twitter or follow, but some are. And that's enough. And then what I would say is you get to the four, five, 15, 17 pages that people are fans of. You, you, you go against that and then you create a lookalike audience against that. You also take the data you have. I don't know if you're selling direct, but if you have any email data or anything of that nature, you can create lookalike audiences. That's people's behavior is similar on Facebook and that's where you're getting your scale from. You got something, Stefan? Uh, 36. 
Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, 36,000. Yeah, so. That was way off. Here we go. So, I mean, look, there's 36,000 people that are a fan of the Rogaine page, and so you're able to actually go after the people that did that, and so, you know, I would go after that crew and look alike audiences against that, and, and that, you know, I think SEM. Uh, you know, this is an example where I think search probably wins very heavily, you know, because that's more private action. And so I would buy a lot of keywords on Google. Bing. Yahoo. Laurie asks, if Lizzie opened up a business as direct competition to VaynerMedia or Wine Library, what would you do? <laughs> Lori, I would put Lizzie directly out of fucking business. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be no hesitation. When it comes to war, look, I mean, I wish AJ was here. I think he's in Oklahoma on business, or Tennessee on business. Um, yeah, I mean, under the context of the Jets and football and business, I will slash anyone's face with a hose. I don't know what that means, but I, if Lizzie's like, if I came home and Lizzie's like, I'm starting Lizzie Media and we're gonna crush it, I'm like, that's great. I'm gonna put you directly out of business. That would be the answer. Mike asks, Gary, why do you put so much emphasis onto sports, such as the Jets? I don't know, Mike. Truth is, I really don't know. I mean, you know, when I psychoanalyze myself, I think the Jets specifically was, when I was five, six years old, was the first kind of like Americana thing. I often like saying I learned how to speak English watching the Jets. I mean, at some level it was really Scooby-Doo and uh, the Great Space Coaster and Price is Right. But the Jets were really kind of that first American thing that I associated with the kids in the neighborhood around. And you get into, you know, you get into rhythm, right? It's like working out or reading. Like it, my cadence became like I watch the Jets. And then you go through all those emotions over 35 years. Um, you start really building a loyalty to it. The, the downs and the downs and the slight ups and the downs. And so, you know, you know, I think, uh, I don't know why I put so much emphasis around it. I don't really have the full pledge thing, but that's my best guess. Vivan asks, I am starting a wedding invitation and stationery boutique called Spoken For Co. I publish a post on the company blog every Tuesday. I spend 10 to 15 hours on each post. I create visuals to promote these posts on social media. However, I realize that I'm getting way more likes on my hand-drawn lettering posts compared to these non-hand-drawn ones. What should I do? Vivian, you're spending way too much time on it, in my opinion. 10 to 15 hours feels completely disproportional to the value exchange that you're getting in return. You need to figure out how to do it faster. You also need to become a little less romantic and you need to figure out what your micro version of that is because content is a gateway drug to opportunity and I think your supply and demand or your value in return for the time is off kilter. You're also in a space and you're part of this world because you love the design and the creation and you're an artist at heart um, and so I don't want to tell you what to do, but from a business context, and that's why you asked it on this show, I think there's an inefficiency there and you need to figure out how to make that 10 to 15 hours closer to one to two max, 45 minutes preferably, so you can do a hell of a lot more. Every Tuesday's not enough. I need it more often. The only way I can get it more often from you is if you allow yourself to go faster. This was back to an earlier question in this marathon of T's and I's. I think you're going way too down the perfection variable. And so to prove out my point, I would ask you to try to do what you can do. Do me a favor, next Tuesday, spend two hours on it. See what it does and see what the results are. You may learn from that. And if, and if you hate what happens and there's not a lot of engagement, do it one more time. And if you can get me to three strikes where it doesn't work in three straight Tuesdays, then you can go back to doing your thing. But my gut tells me that won't be the case. Lisa asks, what's your spirit animal? And Lisa, finally. So everybody, thanks so much for hanging with me. That was fun. The marathon's fun. I have a funny feeling we're getting a lot of comments of like, this is what you should do. You'll get so many more answers. I got so much more value. Lisa. My spirit animal is Battle Cat from He Man. Actually, Ram Man. Ram Man from He Man. Uh, if you don't know what it looks like, it looks like this. Question of the day What is your spirit animal? You keep asking questions, I'll keep answering them. I got nothing yet. <laughs> All right. Um, from Lee. Actually, I do have something. Oh. Sorry, India. That's fine. Uh, scared the crap out of you. <laughs> and I'm feeling D-Rock's going to use this footage. Uh, 